it's either jail or treatment. Uh, doesn't make any sense when the vast majority of people don't need either. This book is a hybrid, if you will, memoir, science book, and policy. What I thought I'd do here today was to focus a little bit on the science, why I wrote the book. Um, I've been studying drugs for about 22, 23 years. And one of the things that I contend in the book is that there have been some assumptions made about drugs that are false, um, bad, and that has led to bad drug policy. And so I think I'll talk about one component of what I highlight in the book. Uh, and that component, what I'd like to talk about is the work or the science that I've been doing and other people have been doing with methamphetamine. Back in 2005, I got a call from the Office of National Drug Control Policy asking me to participate in a round table of writers who were interested in writing stories about methamphetamine. They wanted their stories to be more realistic. They were writers for things like Law and Order, CSI, magazines, and so forth. Uh, at this round table, we had uh, participate, the, the panelists were a U.S. assistant attorney, an undercover narcotics officer, an adult person who was addicted to methamphetamine, an adolescent who was addicted to uh, methamphetamine, and myself. Uh, my role at the panel was to help participants understand where the science was at the time, uh, what we knew from the empirical information. And so I proceeded to summarize what we knew Basically, what I said was that we had, at the, up to that point, we had tested relatively low oral doses in the laboratory where we gave to people, and we evaluated the effects of those doses of methamphetamine on cognitive performance, mood, heart rate, blood pressure, those sorts of things. And my conclusions were that the drug was quite unremarkable. In fact, in people who are well-rested, you didn't see much in terms of cognitive disruptions. You didn't see any. Um, uh, those, those low doses produce some euphoria, but uh, moderate range of euphoria. Um, when I finished my presentation, my fellow panelists were horrified. They were horrified because they had told stories about the horrors of methamphetamine that they saw in the natural ecology. They recounted stories of methamphetamine users developing superhuman strength. When someone was on methamphetamine, it was said that you had to increase the caliber of weapon. Uh, regular tasers no longer worked with these, these individuals. Another story that was recounted was that uh, methamphetamine was like no other drug that law enforcement had ever seen. Uh, this particular uh, cop said he had more than 20-something years of experience uh, on the force and had never seen anything like methamphetamine, and he had seen crack users and that sort of thing. So this drug, methamphetamine, he claimed, uh, exerted unique pharmacological effects. Finally, when I challenged uh, some of the claims that were being made, he turned to me and he said, Dr. Hart, when you see a parent cut the head of their child off and throw it at you, then maybe perhaps you will become a believer. So the idea was that this parent was so cognitively impaired, she cut the head off of her kid and threw it at this cop. Now, I tried to explain that um, these types of stories, these anecdotes, particularly about drugs, they weren't new. We had heard them before. The stories about drug users developing superhuman strength. The stories about some new drug uh, being like no other drug we've ever seen. And the stories about drugs causing this sort of, uh, this wide range of cognitive disruptions. What I'd like to do here in the next few minutes is just evaluate or look at these three sort of claims that seem to be pervasive in our history when it comes to drugs. Um, the first, uh, these individuals developing superhuman strength. At this roundtable, I tried to explain that this wasn't new. 
If you go back to the New York Times, for example, on February 8th, 1914, what you find there is a huge editorial. Uh, Negro cocaine fiends are a new southern menace. In this piece, he argued that black people, when they have cocaine, they develop superhuman strength. So much so that southern police forces had to increase the caliber of their weapons. They moved from the 32 caliber weapon to the 38 caliber weapon because the 32 caliber weapon or bullets didn't affect black people on cocaine. <laughs> I know it sounds comical, but this was actually believed. And these things come back in new forms. If you all think about maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, we heard about the guy in Miami who uh, chewed the face off of, of another guy. The officer believes the man clearly, clearly was on some very, very powerful drugs. It was said that the person was on bath salts, and bath salts uh, cause such extreme effects that you get this kind of behavior. But when the toxicology was in, we looked at what was in the person's system, there was no bath salts in this person's system. The only thing that was in the person's system was THC. And THC, we don't know when was the last time this person had used THC. It could have been weeks. But the point is, is that these arguments, these claims, um, they are recycled generation after generations. And we laugh at some of them because of the language, but the language is tempered for, to fit the contemporary folk, where it doesn't seem so outrageous if you're not a critical thinker. But, uh, but of course, most of these claims are um, just exaggeration. The other claim that methamphetamine produces unique cognitive effect or unique effects in general, I hadn't collected any evidence to address this claim. Uh, but what I did, along with my PhD student at the time, Matt Kirkpatrick, we ran a study in which we gave uh, research participants, of course we passed all of the ethical requirements. Uh, we gave research participants intranasal methamphetamine at a low dose and a large dose uh, on one day, but it's all under blind conditions. And we gave them deamphetamine, the active ingredient in Adderall, on other days. And we evaluated the effects of these drugs. Of course, placebo was included. We evaluated the effects of these drugs to see whether or not they, methamphetamine was unique uh, compared to just regular amphetamine. Because when you look at the chemical structure of these drugs, they look almost identical, excepting for the uh, methyl group that's on the methamphetamine structure. But they are nearly identical. And what we found was that the drugs produced nearly identical effects. They are the same drug. Methamphetamine is the same drug as the active ingredient in Adderall. And so the notion that methamphetamine uh, produces unique effect is just simply not supported by evidence from research. Uh, we weren't the first people to do that. Other folks had done, had, had, had done this sort of thing with oral uh, methamphetamine compared to oral deamphetamine. Finally, uh, I was interested in um, this notion that methamphetamine causes all of these cognitive disruptions. If you all have been paying attention in the country for the past, oh, five to 10 years, you might know something about the Montana Meth Project, in which they make these slick advertisements, which they call education, um, about methamphetamines or the dangers of methamphetamines. And oftentimes, these advertisements uh, indicate that methamphetamine causes uh, widespread cognitive disruptions. And then it seemed as though the scientific literature was in support of what was being said in these advertisements. So what I did in 2012, I published a review of all of the scientific literature that was relevant for cognitive performance and for brain imaging. What I concluded was this. The scientific interpretation or the interpretations in the scientific literature 
were wildly overstated in terms of the effects of methamphetamine on cognition, in terms of the effects of methamphetamine on brain structure. Now, I wish I was the first person to do this sort of thing, to really call into question the exaggerations. But since we are here at Reason, I have to give props to Jacob Solom. Jacob had been writing about this for some period. The vast majority of people who use illegal drugs are not addicts, are not heavy users, and they're not uh, posing any kind of threat to other people, well, nor, nor are they harming themselves. That's, well, that's your opinion. I don't know if it's that's It's not just true. opinion. This is based upon data well, that's available from the federal government. If you look at patterns of use, you, you will can see... Spin any, you can spin data it, any way you want. No, this we is got quite plain. Mr. Hey, Mr. Solomon, this is a yeah. discussion, all right? Don't get in a car and don't come near my family. If you want to see a scientific paper on this, my paper was published in Neuropsychopharmacology in 2012, and you can actually see it for yourself. So given that we have assumptions our drug policy is based on these faulty assumptions. One of the things that I call for in high price is that we should rethink, reevaluate how we are regulating drugs like methamphetamine, drugs like heroin, drugs like cocaine, and so forth. And the main reason I call for this reevaluation is this. Each year in this country, we arrest 1.5 million people for drug-related violations. More than 80% of them are for simple possession. Now, if our assumptions that these, that these drugs are so dangerous, we have to go after them with such ferocity, are faulty, I think that we could decrease the blemishes that we put on people's records by decriminalizing drugs rather than the approach that we're taking. Now, when you call for decriminalization in this country, you have to provide some education because the country is quite ignorant about drug policy, uh, about drugs in general. Um, decriminalization is not legalization. Legalization is what we're doing with alcohol. Alcohol, if you're 21 or older, you can purchase alcohol without fear of being prosecuted. You can sell alcohol legally. Decriminalization, uh, you cannot sell drugs. They still remain illegal. Possession also remains illegal, but you can no longer get um, a criminal record from possessing a drug. Instead, it would be treated like we treat traffic violations. Um, that way, we uh, decrease the likelihood of putting blemishes on people's records and uh, enhance the likelihood that, that they will be able to get jobs and contribute to society. When we think about the guys who have occupied the White House, President Obama, President Bush, President Clinton, all three of those guys used illegal drugs in their youth. If they would have been caught, they would have, been, uh, they would have gotten felony charges and probably, not, probably would not have been allowed to make the contributions that they have made to our country. My expertise are the effects of drugs on people, right? And, there's a, and one of the things that happens in this discussion is that experts are very comfortable talking on areas in which they have limited expertise. I'm not one of them. And I have limited expertise in, in markets. But what I can tell you is why I favor decriminalization rather than legalization. Legalization for example, would make drugs probably more available. I don't know that to be, that's a prediction for some. But what I do know is that legalization will provide the opportunity for people to exaggerate the extent of the harms caused by drugs. I know that for a fact. And because the country is so ignorant about what drugs actually do, I am arguing in the high price that we should decriminalize and then have a corresponding increase in education about these drugs, realistic education. So when I say realistic education, since I've been talking about methamphetamine, methamphetamine since it causes people to have, to have increased heart rate, blood pressure, and so forth. Number one killer in the United States is heart disease. If you have cardiac issues, the public health message will be blared don't take methamphetamine. Another issue, uh, methamphetamine is outstanding at keeping people awake. 
chronic sleep loss associated with cancers, all kinds of cancers associated with psychiatric illness. The public health message would be, please don't take methamphetamine near bedtime, get sleep. Those sorts of things, this is realistic education to help people. So that's why my focus has been on decriminalization rather than legalization. I think the country's too ignorant. We haven't had an adult conversation about drugs and I'm trying to do that with high price. Yes? Are all these stories just totally fabricated out of thin air? Because I, I recall way back when it was demon weed uh, about marijuana and uh, the devil rum, and uh, it, it, they all just seem to be total fabrications. Now, one thing I don't, I don't want to leave the audience with the impression that psychoactive drugs, the ones that we're talking about, uh, I don't want to leave you with the impression that they don't have potentially powerful mind-altering effects, because they do. Now, many of the stories told about those drugs, like marijuana in the 1930s, uh, the demon rum, and that sort of thing, <sighs> drugs serve as a convenient tool stories about drugs serve as convenient tools to further demonize groups that we don't like. So we associate marijuana with those Mexicans who are taking jobs from the good folks in Texas. From those, for, uh, they're taking jobs from, from white folks in the South. Black folks are taking jobs from white folks in the South. Um, we don't like them. So we associate drugs that are not used widely in the society with a specific uh, despised group. Now, today, it's a hell of a lot more difficult to demonize marijuana as we once did in the 1930s. Uh, the use of marijuana at that time was not as widespread as it is today. Um, and so, uh, when you have something like, fast forward to the 1980s, a number of people had used powder cocaine. We're in LA here. Hollywood uh, <laughs> was really supporting that industry. Uh, but there was not a number of people using crack cocaine. So now you can say this is a new form of cocaine. It's not the cocaine that you're using, my man. Uh, <laughs> this is a new form. And, so, and it's associated with these people, even though uh, black people didn't use crack cocaine at higher rates than white folks. But Certainly, uh, based on the media sort of uh, portrayal, depiction, uh, it was easy to get that impression, and so you can now vilify crack cocaine. Uh, methamphetamine today uh, is associated with despised groups, um, poor white trash, uh, gay folks, that sort of thing. You can, and a, lar a smaller number, a relatively small number of people use methamphetamine, so you can vilify those groups. Um, but it's a hell of a lot more difficult to vilify marijuana today. What did the data show on addiction and, and would decriminalization help that process of, of getting off of addiction or is addiction exaggerated in general? The vast majority of people who use these substances are not addicted. Maybe 10 to 20 percent are, uh, but 80, 90 percent are not. Most of our attention when we talk about these drugs are focused on this small pathological group. Um, and um, so when you read something like high price, I focus more on the 80 to 90 percent. Um, so decriminalization in terms of its impact on addiction treatment. Well, I hope that uh, we would redistribute the money that law enforcement currently gets for we spend $26 billion a year on our sort of dealing with this drug problem. Uh, if we redistribute the money into uh, treatment, treatment research, um, it would enhance treatment. We currently have some pretty good treatments to treat substance abuse. Uh, it's just that we also have a lot of quacks out there. And we, have to, we also have to realize, too, that uh, like law enforcement, uh, the treatment industry has a stake in our current approach. So it's either jail or treatment. Uh, doesn't make any sense when the vast majority of people don't need either.
I sit on a number of review committees, and one of the things that we want to make sure before people get approval to study these drugs is that they have the appropriate amount of experience to do this research. Make sure that they have the appropriate safeguards in place, because you can imagine if you have people do this kind of research and they don't have the experience, they don't have the appropriate safeguards, and someone gets hurt. You can imagine how that will set back the scientific investigation into this study. Think about Timothy Leary. Him and his antics set back the research into hallucinogens 40 years. Uh, and so we don't want to see that happen again. Um, and so if people want to study these drugs and they have the appropriate training, experience, facilities, I'm willing to help anybody if they have those sort of things in place. Is there any study that's ever shown that any of these substances force people to do bad things, violence, uh, crimes, and so on? We have been doing this research for uh, decades in which we bring people into the lab and administer drugs to, in order to develop better treatments, in order to uh, determine the effects of drugs on people for a wide range of reasons. In none of these cases, I mean, we've given drugs like heroin, methamphetamine, crack cocaine, marijuana, you name it, alcohol. So we've given thousands of doses of these drugs. Haven't seen any violence in the context in which we give these drugs. That's not to say that people who use drugs don't get violent sometimes. It has to be within the context. So. Yeah, you might see some violence with, with, with uh, some of these drugs, but it's certainly not because of the pharmacology of the drugs. So people, sometimes when we have this kind of discussion, we sometimes think that, well, if one person gets violent on crack cocaine and we were more lenient with our policies, that's enough to change the policy. Uh, of course, that's ridiculous. You know, the notion that we can prevent every accident, every sort of bad thing from happening in a society, um, if people have that notion, they probably shouldn't be allowed to talk to the public. <laughs> I think I'll talk about one component of what I highlight in the book. Uh, and that component, what I'd like to talk about is the work or the science that I've been doing and other people have been doing with methamphetamine. Back in 2005, I got a call from the Office of National Drug Control Policy asking me to participate in a roundtable of writers who were interested in writing stories about methamphetamine. They wanted their stories to be more realistic. They were writers for things like Law and Order, CSI, magazines, and so forth. Uh, at this roundtable, we had uh, participate, the, the panelists were a U.S. assistant attorney, an undercover narcotics officer, an adult person who was addicted to methamphetamine, an adolescent who was addicted to uh, methamphetamine, and myself. Uh, my role at the panel was to help participants understand where the science was at the time, uh, what we knew from the empirical information. And so I proceeded to summarize what we knew. Basically what I said was that we had, at the, up to that point, we had tested relatively low oral doses in the laboratory where we gave to people and we evaluated the effects of those doses of methamphetamine on, so it's either jail or treatment. Uh, doesn't make any sense when the vast majority of people don't need either. This book is a hybrid, if you will, memoir, science book, and policy. What I thought I'd do here today was to focus a little bit on the science, why I wrote the book. Um, I've been studying drugs for about 22, 23 years. And one of the things that I contend in the book is that there have been some assumptions made about drugs that are false, um, bad. And that has led to bad drug policy. And so cognitive performance, mood, heart rate, blood pressure, those sorts of things. And my conclusions were that the drug was quite unremarkable. In fact, in people who are well rested, 
you didn't see much in terms of cognitive disruptions. You didn't see any. Um, uh, those, those low doses produce some euphoria, but uh, moderate range of euphoria. Um, when I finished my presentation, my fellow panelists were horrified. They were horrified because they had told stories about the horrors of methamphetamine that they saw in the natural ecology. They recounted stories of methamphetamine users developing superhuman strength. When someone was on methamphetamine, it was said that you had to increase the caliber of weapon. Uh, regular tasers no longer worked with these, these individuals. Another story that was recounted was that uh, methamphetamine was like no other drug that law enforcement had ever seen. Uh, this particular uh, cop said he had more than 20-something years of experience uh, on the force and had never seen anything like methamphetamine, and he had seen crack users and that sort of thing. So this drug, methamphetamine, 